Today I'm giving you a thumbnail sketch of the Bible. Adam and Eve failed. They sinned. They went away from God. God began a uh, a trajectory of how he was going to restore Shalom to the garden, how he was going to fix everything, which God does fix. And so we kind of get our first glimpse of the real fixing in the story of Abraham. And there's a couple of different aspects of that story that I need to highlight. Number one, um, God cuts a covenant with Abraham and says, hey, you got the kind of heart that I want I want to have a relationship with people like, like you, and I want your progeny to be people that are sons and daughters of Abraham, where they have a circumcised heart toward me. And in fact, that is the sign of that covenant, that Abraham and his descendants would be circumcised. And even though that's applied to males, I'm going to say there's a female aspect to that too, and I'll cover that in another video. But God has that kind of relationship with Abraham. and. Yeah, God says, I'm going to give you a land, a people. Uh, hey, if you can count the number of stars in the sky, that's how many people you're going to have. This is all very good news. And Abraham believes God. Now, in a Hebrew culture, you got to remember that it says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But if you look, for example, in Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 5, you'll see that it was credited to him because he was also faithful to God's commandments and ordinances. So James says, faith without works is dead. In a Hebrew mind, you just can't separate faith and works. They're just together. If you have faith, it will manifest in particular works. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, another aspect of Abraham's story is that there's this fight between some kings and there's this one king who happens to be a priest. His name is Melchizedek. He brings out some bread and wine foreshadowing Jesus' ministry because Jesus is going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. I mean, who knows how it all exactly works? I don't know, but we know it all works. And Abraham brings a tenth and he, is, he, worship, he in a sense worships this Melchizedek king. I mean, honors him in some way. And I don't have the complete story, but we know this Melchizedek is going to be important as we get to Hebrews and the Millennial Kingdom. So let's just kind of put that on pause. There's the Abrahamic covenant. Then it's predicted and it actually happens that all the Israelites find themselves in bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt. Moses has this encounter at a burning bush. God says, I want you to go get them and come worship me on this mountain. Notice the word worship. Worship isn't just, you know, praising God, singing to God, and also being, you know, day by day, moment by moment in this kind of trajectory lifestyle of God. It's also pressing into a particular narrative where we recognize Jesus as king. Notice about something about kingship. Kings have a land. Kings have parameters or laws. And think about this. If we do not understand or observe God's laws, we're essentially kind of stripping him of his kingship. I don't want to do that. That ain't cool. I was doing that because I was making up that I was, you know, I'm totally free. I can do what I want because of Jesus. And there's a sense in which, I mean, I can botch up and God still loves me, but there's a sense in which I don't want to willfully strip him of his kingship. And so I don't want to do that. So God ends up making a covenant with Israel at Sinai. You can read about this in Exodus chapter 19. And the points I want to make here is that um, I call it a Sinaitic covenant because the covenant isn't just with Moses, it's with all the Israelites. And the sign of that covenant is a Sabbath. It's the Sabbath, which is interesting because the very covenant that has a big to-do list you have to understand something. The stuff that God gives us to do are things that help us to know Yeshua better, to understand his ministry. And ultimately, when we do these things, we're, we'll be blessed because the apex of doing the feast days, for example, is to know that we can rest in the finished work of our Messiah. See how that works? So that's the sign. Everything in the Mosaic or Sinaitic Covenant point to the rest that we can have 
in Yeshua's finished work in all aspects. So don't just hear Passover lamb, it's also about Jesus' resurrection and the finished work of giving the Holy Spirit, the finished work of redeeming Israel and the tabernacle, Feast of Tabernacle sequence. You can read all about that in Leviticus 23. Now, this is kind of this um, earthly rendition, a shadow of the, the kingdom that God actually wants us to do. I mean, he doesn't want us just to, he doesn't want us to not just uh, walk in spiritual non-adultery, he actually wants us to not commit adultery. You see how that works? We can't, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the, the physical and the spiritual, and both have got to come together. Well, anyway, in Exodus 32, they mess up, they make a golden calf, and God creates this provision. And the provision is even though he wanted to bring them out of Egypt, that he might be their king, their high priest, and that they would be a holy nation, a priesthood of believers, you know, they just totally fail. And so God makes this provision of Levitical priesthood. Now, even the, the Levites, some are going to uh, be given to idols. And so there's a stream of Levites um, of Zadok that show up in the third temple in the millennial kingdom. And so when you read in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, you'll see them at work. So let's just bracket that, move on to the Davidic covenant, where we're gonna now be thrust into the millennial kingdom where Jesus is gonna return. And, and even though David at that time wants to build a house for God because he loves God and God says, well, you know, you're gonna build me a house all, all right. Well, your son will but I'm actually gonna build you a house and on your throne, I'm gonna place a king that's gonna be forever and ever. And the sign of that is gonna be a house. And then we have the new covenant. The new covenant is in Jesus's blood. And you can read about this in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses uh, 31 through around 34. And there, the Torah or the law, God's law is gonna be written on our hearts. Now we have no reason to believe that the law that God's writing on our hearts and the actual written law are two different things. Now I would say that in our hearts, it's the, 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 the spirit of the law is there, the, the qualitative part of the law is there, but that would never manifest itself apart from the activities and ordinances that God has given us to exalt Jesus as King. So that's why that you know, the, that's why the, the Spirit is given to us, that our heart of stone, because that's what happened to the Jews, right? They're doing the Torah in cultural ways, but God wants us to do it, but he doesn't want us to do it because of tradition or culture. He wants us to do it because our hearts are circumcised and that we're pressing into those things and like, you know, by the Spirit in a way that's good and healthy and right and with understanding and wisdom. So. In the millennial kingdom, Jesus is gonna come back and the new covenant is still gonna be pointing out. I think a lot of people think that by the new covenant in Jesus' blood that everything happened right there in the New Testament and it's just not done yet. The spring feast days of Passover, first fruits and, I got something on my lip, and first fruits and, and uh, counting, counting up to Pentecost, that was Jesus, the work of Jesus' first coming. And that's part of the new covenant, but it's still going to play out where Jesus returns again. And so the fall feast days that begin on Tishri 1, again, you can read about this all in Leviticus 23. And uh, you have uh, Yom Teruah, or the day of shouting, the feast of trumpets, 10 days later, then you have Yom Kippurim, and then five days later, you move into uh, Sukkot, or the feast of tabernacles. And then you have the eighth day, it's called Shemini Atzeretz. Other videos I'm gonna cover all this. But ultimately, here's what's gonna happen, is that Jesus is gonna come back and a third tabernacle is gonna happen. And in that third tabernacle, all the feast days and God's ordinances are going to be happening. Why? Just think about this. Why would it happen in the Mosaic Covenant, the prophets say, do all that stuff. Jesus says he doesn't abolish the law. And when Jesus returns, we know it's all gonna happen. Why do we not do it now? Well, that's just the thing. We're supposed to be doing it now. Now, I, I, I get emails from students all the time that say something like, well, there's 613 of those things that I'm supposed to do. 
it just doesn't it doesn't work quite that way. There is no tabernacle presently, so you don't you don't do a lot of those laws. A lot of laws Christians already naturally do, for example, don't commit adultery. I know that's both a spiritual principle, but I actually don't commit adultery on my wife or God. Actually. Uh, I don't want to have idols. Actually, both in the spirit and in the physical. So uh, you know, and Sabbath is like that too. I'm gonna to both rest in my Messiah, Hebrews 4, but I'm also going to observe his Sabbath days. Now, I'm not perfect on this, but I'm getting closer because I want to push in that narrative of worship. Because when I do that, I rest in the finished work of my Messiah and what he's going to do in that millennial kingdom. Now, I'm gonna read you just a couple of texts and we'll wrap up here. Ezekiel 44, verses 23 and 24. The Levitical priesthood, the Zadok line, it says, Moreover, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. In a dispute, they shall take their stand to judge. They shall judge it according to my ordinances. They shall also keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed feasts and sanctify my Sabbaths. Clearly, during the millennial reign, which I'm taking as literal, God somehow, now the prince that's in uh, Ezekiel 44 and 45, I'm not ready to go quite out there whether or not that is Messiah or not Messiah. There's two different arguments there, but I'm just gonna say somehow, some way, that the feast days and God's ordinances are going to be observed and King Yeshua is going to be administering this through the priesthood. Well, it's gonna happen. Now, here's what else we can look at. Zechariah 14, 16. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Look at verse 17, if you don't do it, it's not gonna rain on you. Here's my point. My point is, is that a kingdom is coming where these ordinances and all Yahweh's feast days are going to be observed. Now, one last thought here. If you go to Hebrews chapter 7, the one that ultimately sits on the throne is a priest king. That's Jesus. And he's not from the Levitical tribe. He's in the order of Mel Melchizedek. And it says in Hebrews 7 that if there's a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. Now, it doesn't mean all the law. That's still worship. We still press into it. But here's what it says in verse 15. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement. Here's the change but according to the power of an indestructible life. So what begins to happen in the millennial kingdom, best I can tell, is that we move back into that Sinaitic covenant by the power of the Spirit, with Abrahamic covenant, circumcised hearts, observing those things that exalt every aspect of Jesus' work and ministry, it is administered by the true high priest that will not die. It's not the Levit Levites that die and have to be replaced. But instead, not like Aaron, it is in the order of Melchizedek. And then ultimately, and I'm not sure how this part works, but I do know that ultimately, those that follow Jesus will become also ones who have an indestructible life because they will be redeemed by the blood of a lamb and then they will now be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Look, I don't know how it all works, but I do know that when I cover all the proof texts that show why Jesus and the apostle Paul didn't do away with, it, with anything, it's, it will all fall flat if I don't tell you where it's all going because ultimately, if I don't observe the feast days and Yahweh's ordinances, I am stripping Jesus of his kingdom because he is a king. And really it's about him. But there is a blessing if I follow these things. The blessing is, is that when I do the feast days and observe the ordinances, I learn more about my Messiah. And there's a blessing in that 
I'm worshiping my king in the way that he wants to be, he wants to be worshiped because it glorifies Jesus and an aspect of his ministry. I didn't get that all perfect, but it gives you a glimpse. I'll see you next week.